Good evening, everybody. I think we'll get started now. Um, so, uh, first thing to say is welcome. Welcome to this year's Anthony Hyman Memorial Lecture. And welcome to Kate. Kate Clark, who I'll introduce in a second as our speaker. Uh, my name is Jonathan Goodhand. I'm a professor in conflict and development studies in the development studies department. And I'm representing the uh, the Center for the Study of Contemporary Central Asia and the Caucasus, who are um, hosting this event at, at SARS today. Um, welcome to a lot of old friends. Uh, every year, obviously, we get older. This is the first event of uh, <laughs> 2022, uh, I think it was, with Barney Rubin. Is that right, David? 2002. 2000. 2003, was it? Yeah. 2003. Okay. So we've been going for 21 years. And uh, yeah. many of you came to that first event. And uh, and uh, it's good to see also some new faces who haven't been here before. So those who don't know about this event, this is um, an annual event that has become very significant in the field of Afghan studies in the UK and beyond. And this event to celebrate the life and the work of Anthony Hyman, who was a scholar, a long-term friend of, of SARS, and he contributed in very important ways to scholarship on Afghanistan and Central Asia. Uh, and we're also very happy that his wife, Hillary, and extended family are here today as they um, as they happy into other events. Um, I'd also like to thank Central Asian Survey, who have been a, a generous supporter of this event, and they also have a, a, a store outside um, that there is, um, for a reception which will be happening after this event. Um, I'd also like to thank um, just to embarrass David Page because uh, he has been um, one of the principal kind of organizers, forces of the event, and has come to have been um, to get me talk over the years. So thank you very much to him, and thank you also finally to Charles and Hannah so as who have supported the kind of uh, the logistics and administration of this event and have made such a success over the years. So, a short introduction to Kate, and uh, she has, she, she follows in a very illustrious line of speakers, um, all of whom have played a very important role as scholars, as researchers, as activists, and policy makers, in shaping how we think about and engage with Afghanistan and its place in the world. And all of them have, have been invited because they have a long engagement with the country and they've devoted a major part of their lives and their careers to that sort of energy. To, and, and Kate is no exception in this respect. And I, we were talking earlier thinking about when did we first meet? And it was actually in 1991 in Peshawar, um, where we were both in our 20s and I was an aid worker about to leave the country, having spent three years there, and the cake uh, attend my leaving party. <laughs> and uh, yeah, over 30 years later, we still work on the country. We took very different paths, but we're here, we're here today. I'm really delighted to have uh, Kate and give this talk to, um, today. Just to give a bit of background, um, after that very famous leaving party, <laughs> Kate uh, then went and um, studied uh, uh, Middle Eastern Studies, did an MA, uh, and then she joined the, the BBC World Service in 1995. And uh, she got wind of this job that was coming up um, in the BBC as the BBC correspondent in Kabul. And uh, she she got the job and she went in 1999 to Kabul, was one of the only Western journalists there. Um, she, you know, she was very. Um, you know, she travelled around the country. She did a lot of stories. Ultimately, she was PNG um, in two thousand and one, wasn't it? As a result of some of her stories, including the ones that are critical of the Taliban. Remember, this was when the Taliban were in power. It was the Taliban first regime. Um, so she really had a kind of a wingside seat to see how the Taliban were governing at that time. And she wrote also quite critically, and, and one of the things I think was in relation to the you know, Zara massacres and the PNG at that time. So that was March 9, 2001. She returned very quickly um, 
and that's this was in was it November 2001 mm -hmm. and this was um in front of the Northern Alliance walking into Kabul with John Simpson um following uh you know the events of 9-11 then the, the bombing of, 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 of Afghanistan and the the, the, the Taliban um being replaced by the Republic. Um she then um having she came back to, to she then she then kind of took on a new hat she became independent uh, a freelancer and she then joined the afghan analyst network and uh, the senior analyst and from 2010 she was part of the afghan analyst network and those of you who work on the country will be very familiar with the work of the afghan analyst network. anyone who knows that afghanistan will know the work of um, this organization They've been one of the key producers of, of important knowledge about the country. Initially, it was about trying to inform Westerners who had come flooded into the country um, and often very ill informed about it. So it was about trying to increase understanding and knowledge about the politics, the economy, the society. Um, but it was more than just producing knowledge for foreigners. It, it, it has become a very important source of. Of, of thinking about Afghanistan much more broadly than this. So it's produced things about Afghan falconry, about poetry, about culture, about the everyday lives of Afghans um, and, and, and their experiences in the country, whether it's struggling with drought, whether it's Afghan farmers trying to get bridge across the border, um, you know, and, and or whether it's the sort of things that the case has been producing about Afghan taxation, about state formation. Um, and about the, the, the effects of the um, of, of droughts on the, of the country's agriculture and the economy. So, case has played, has played a very important role in, in increasing our understanding of the country. And uh, she's going to be talking about today um, the Taliban in power stop taking of the second amendment. And we think it's in spite of the fact that a lot of tension has drifted away from Afghanistan for quite you know, understandable reasons in, in recent months and in the last year, because what's happening in Ukraine and now Gaza, um, we think taking stock at this present moment is very, very important. And Kate is very well positioned to do this, having lived within you know, and, and observed at first hand the first Emirates and then the, the second Emirates. So just to, to explain the, the formats, Kate's going to talk for about 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. Um, and then we will have uh, a reception uh, around about eight o'clock um, afterwards, where we can continue the conversation. So thank you very much, Kate. Yeah. Very good to have you. <laughs> so, so I think, how is that per uh, level? It's good, including in the front row with yep. people who are not so good with their hearing. Yes, yeah. good. Yeah. Right. So I would, I always forget to thank people, and I'm always shamed by Afghans because they always thank people so nicely. So thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, David. Members of Anthony's family, um, the Central Asian Survey, and so as it's a great honour to be speaking today, and. One of the nice things about being asked to give the Anthony Hyman Memorial Lecture is that it was an excuse to go back to Anthony's writing. Now, I didn't know him, but of course, you know, if you work on Afghanistan, you will know these seminal figures. Um, if people haven't read his work, I would counsel going back to Afghanistan under Soviet domination, seminal work in 1982. He's a good writer. He writes clearly, he tells stories, he's humane. He um, he goes against conventional wisdom. And of course, for someone like me, who's done a lot of work on human rights and war crimes, his work in that area was also fundamental for getting stories of the of the early years of uh, after the Saur revolution and the uh, the resistance, the Mujahideen out to the world. And I wanted to start by actually that's really low down. Just wondering if I can make it a bit higher. Um, has anyone got a book? 
Nice hardback hard book. Anyone? Oh, thank you. Central Asian Service. Perfect. Thank you. Let's see if that works with that. Ah, oh, very good. Who's the scholar in the audience? Who's the scholar? Thank you very much. Is that Sana? Look at that. Very good. Thank you, Sana. That's going to be much easier. Right. <laughs> so, where I want to start is one of the first stories that I worked on as a BBC reporter. I arrived in November 1999 in Kabul, and it was coming up for the 20th anniversary since the Soviets had invaded. And I drove from the BBC office in Wazir at Bakhan to the biggest, probably the oldest cemetery in Kabul, Shahadaya Salahin, through devastated Kabul. Those who were there will remember the ruins from the civil war. And the question I asked then was, when will the war end? And of course, two years later, it ended very, very abruptly after the 9-11 attacks. Everything changed. Um, my colleague William was already in Kabul. We should mention him with the BBC, William Reeve. Um, I walked in to Kabul the day it fell. There were crowds of supporters of the Northern Alliance in the north, particularly the Sharai Nazar faction. Uh, they were really happy. But going into the city, there were a lot of misgivings. And people were really worried about who was taking over. So the people who bombed the city were now in power. And it was basically the same across the country. Commanders drove in from Pakistan, took up their old governorships or police posts or got into the cabinet. That first cabinet was four fifths were people from the factions, either military or civilian. So there were misgivings, but there were also there was a, it was a time of hope, huge relief. And it wasn't really so much that the Taliban had gone, but that the war had ended that peace had come. And I was warned by another colleague, Bakr Moin, head of the Persian service. And he said to me, Kate, it's not gonna last. There's a problem with this regime change. And that's the foreigners got rid of the Taliban. They will be back. Afghans have not dealt with the Taliban. And of course, you know, whether he was his reasoning was right, the Taliban would be back 20 years later and after many, many, many more years of bitter war. And I've started at this place. It might be a strange place to start for looking at the second Islamic Emirate to look back to the, the demise of the first. But I think uh, history is important. Changes of regime are important. We've had many since Anthony wrote that first book. He'd already seen, what, four changes? Four presidents by that point. No, I think we're now on the 10th since the Saar revolution. Um, history is important. The way regimes change is important. And I will come back to, to the way that the Taliban lost power in 2001, because I think it's important for thinking about whether, how long, how sustainable the current emirate is. So, oh, I forgot to set my counter. Hang on, so I don't talk forever. So I'm going to split into this, this lecture into five parts. I'm gonna start by looking at why the Taliban managed to come back to power eventually so easily. I'm going to look at the advantages that the Emirate has had. I'm going to look at the problems and the difficulties that they face. I'm going to look at how they've ruled public finance, social restrictions, and the nature of the regime. And finally, I'm going to return to 2001 and what I think are warnings from that, that year. So looking at why the Taliban managed to take back power in, finally took Kabul on the 15th of August, 2021. My goodness, it was quick. You know, the Republic toppled, the districts toppled like a house of cards very, very quickly. There was rapid regime change. It was in that sense, it was like 2001 or 1992. Once change happened, it happened very quickly. And we can look at the reasons for that. 
I mean, obviously the first is that Donald Trump and Salmai Khalazar decided to negotiate an unconditional withdrawal for US troops from Afghanistan. Um, they didn't talk to other Afghans, they didn't talk to the government, they didn't talk to, well, men or women in that point. Um, and unlike the USSR, which spent the last three years of its occupation building up Najibullah, um, Zal undercut the Republic, undermined the Republic, legitimized the Taliban. And um, with the sort of fantasy peace process, which distracted from the what was actually happening. Look at the Republic itself. It's politicians too busy squabbling over power and money to appreciate the danger of the wolf at the door, officers selling ammunition or food rations, the ghost school, uh, the ghost soldiers, ghost police. Remember the rival inaugurations of Ashraf Ghani and Dr. Abdullah in 2020, or them, them squabbling about whether they should both go to see President Biden in June 2021 as the country was being lost. Uh, they weren't, the Republic wasn't serious about holding on to power. And they were confident to the last that the US would always be there. Now compare that to the Taliban, they were very serious. They ramped up violence in those last few months. The nasty assassination campaign in Kabul and elsewhere, the worst winter that we saw for civilian casualties, a time when normally the fighting drops down. And when uh, now President Biden announced that withdrawals would start on the 1st, Americans would be out by the length of September, of course, as always, the priority was what was the domestic politics. What did that have to happen? Have what did that have to do with Afghanistan, the 9-11 anniversary? Only to do with America and Biden. As it was, he gave the Taliban a target date. He, he it meant that they had no reason to delay. The gloves were off, no more concessions. And on May the 1st that year, the government held all the provincial capitals, held all the district centers apart from 31. Control was a bit more split, but even so that was the picture just in May. By August, it was all over and there was the rapid collapse of the government and how different that was from earlier changes of regime. And I'm coming on now to the advantages of, that the Emirate enjoyed. The nature of that regime change, the rapidity meant that they have been in sole territorial control of the country. They are one group. It's not like 2001 or 1994, where there were different factions squabbling for power. It's one group. The, 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 what armed resistance there was pretty well had, had finished by September when Panjshir went. The National Resistance Front, the Islamic State in Khorasan province, they're not, they, they don't really threaten the emirate. Um, and if you look at um, the neighbors, of course, the Taliban also had no territorial control in 2001 after their, uh, their government fell, but they had Pakistan. They had a place from which eventually the insurgency could, could be based and come, could, be, could grow. None of the neighbors are on side this time. So the, the, the Emirate is much, has far fewer threats to it than earlier government's taking over. I'd say as well, that mass evacuation, 100,000 people, some technically able that were lost, but also many who might have been at the forefront of protests or organization, or who had uh, you know, factional networks, all gone and not gone as, as would normally be the case to Pakistan or Iran in the region or bits of Afghanistan that were still not held by the Kabul government, but to North America, to Europe, they're out of the region. They're, the people who might have been agitating against the Taliban are not local anymore. And I think that is also a huge difference. Um, and as well, it sort of formed a pattern. If you're, if you're dissatisfied with the Emirate, you're more likely to want to emigrate, I think now. That mass evacuation, it, it caused a, um, a pattern of what you do if you're not happy. You want to leave. You don't want to try and make things better difficult though that is. And finally, I think people were shell-shocked, absolutely shell-shocked at how things collapsed. And of course, the restrictions came in gradually. So it wasn't like you had the, the new regime up against the people immediately. And 
I don't know who was in Kabul in those last few weeks, but Kabul was not interested in having the Taliban. Every night, people were out on their rooftops shouting Allahu Akbar. This was this was a, a, a response against the encroaching Taliban using Muslim rhetoric. So I'd say far, uh, thirdly, in the end, there wasn't too much blood or destruction. The buildings, the people, the bureaucracy of the state was left intact. The computer systems were up and running. Remember, the Taliban took the custom posts very quickly and they the, immediately, the, the pretty well within weeks, all the all the customs were online. Um, the civil servants were in place. The systems were intact. And for all the problems of the emirate, for all the corruption and a non-serious way that they ruled, the systems of government had been built up in those 20 years. There was a bureaucracy in place. There were ways of doing things. They fell into the Taliban's lap as well. And finally, do you remember the do you remember when um, everyone, when the uh, Khalazad was doing the, his peace process and everyone talked about a peace, a post-peace Afghanistan and what the international community would have to do to support it and the DDR and everything else? Well, who's inherited that peace dividend? It's the Taliban. They've got the, the, the economic boost from that. Um, the farmers who can finally farm in peace. Um, trade can take place. There's no front lines anymore. Um, travel is easier. Afghans have been to places they haven't been for many, many years. Of course, with the caveat that if you're female, it's a lot more difficult now because uh, you need a mahram to travel. Um, officially, more than 70 kilometers from your home, but unofficially outside the house in many places. Um, schooling, primary schooling is up. Um, and that's because of security. Um, the World Bank said that previously, when girls and boys weren't going to school, primary school, they said it's because of security concerns. Now it's because a school is too far away. We've seen huge, huge increases. Um, we're up to about two thirds of girls and boys going to school, particularly in rural areas that increase has happened and particularly for girls. Now again, schooling, difficult. Uh, secondary schooling, of course, girls enrollment is down, but also boys who are having to go out to work, many of them. Um, so all of those, that peace dividend was inherited by the Taliban. And coming on to the problems that the emirate has faced in government, well, if it thought there was a golden goose to be had, it looked at the richness of the Republic, some of which it had been benefiting from as uh, bribing, extorting, taxing, that disappeared overnight. It, the, the, the military victory killed the, the golden go the goose that had been laying the golden eggs. Afghanistan overnight was poorer, substantially poorer. Why? Who's that? Do you, you know this Arabic expression? Patience, <laughs> it's coming. Um, uh, the Taliban had been under UN and US sanctions, either as individuals or as a group. Suddenly that applied to the whole country. Aid was cut off overnight. And the problem was is that Afghanistan had been a country almost uniquely dependent on foreign funds, unearned foreign income. Not only aid, but also military support, also the money that the foreign army spent in Afghanistan. Uh, economists will call it a rent rentier state. It doesn't depend on, it didn't depend on what it earned, it depended on what it, it got. And it was unique in the world, probably only a few Pacific islands, um, the West Bank and Gaza, so the Palestinian territories occupied by Israel, had more aid per capita. And as well as the aid, of course, there was the military spending and the military support. So. In 2019, the Afghan government got 4.7 billion US dollars in military support and about 4 billion in US aid, in sorry, in civilian aid. 22, the aid is back. It's about 3.5 to 4 billion dollars a year. But that's a huge blow to the economy. That's billions of dollars that no longer goes to Afghanistan. 
Um, and that first year was really, really tough with the, when the aid was cut. It did come online, but it was really, really tough. Um, and a lot of people faced sudden employment, sudden hunger, sudden, uh, even in the, in, in the cities, it was particularly bad. And of course, the background is ongoing drought and the climate crisis. So we saw in 2021, the Afghan economy contracted by a fifth. It's still contracting, 22 contracted by another 6%. Last year, we don't have the figures, but I, I'm sure it hasn't grown because of, it, well, for various reasons. I would be really surprised if there's any growth at all. And with a growing population, that's a that's an impoverishment per capita. Poverty levels are back down to where they were pre-COVID. So we've got the end of the war. We've got the uh, aid coming in. We've got remittances. It's still pretty bad. At, at the worst, 2001, um, the World Bank reckoned that 70% of households were unable to meet their basic needs. Some of that's food. The less badly off they'll get food, but not medicine or you know, other basic needs. It's now down to 62%, so about two thirds of Afghans. Um, and the sanctions have been ameliorated but it's still, it's still difficult to trade, to get money and out investment. And that's probably because the, the corresponding banks that have to, do, have to deal with the Afghan banks don't want to get involved in Afghanistan anymore. It's not worth it. They may get problems down the line from the US taking them to court for breaking sanctions. So even though on paper, you can do most things these days, it, it hasn't, hasn't come back. Um, So the Taliban inherited a state dependent on foreign aid and other income. But the divide between them and the old donors is, is really fundamental and it stopped anything but mainly humanitarian aid coming in. It's very important, uh, it supports the economy, but it's a short-term solution for a long-term problem. Um, and you know we, we keep having discussions about whether this should change, but frankly, unless one side or the other backs down, this seems to be the way that things will be done. Humanitarian aid in this situation is expensive, it's inefficient, it creates parallel systems. We all know how, what an unsatisfactory solution is. It is preventing the Afghan economy falling off a cliff and it is keep, keeping people fed. Um, so, and it's difficult to see where growth would come from. Migration is difficult. We've had half a million Afghans being forced back from from Pakistan, we've got the climate crisis, we've got the poppy ban, weak demand, deflation is down, core deflation, core deflation is now, is minus 6.5%, which means that, you know, why would you buy something if it might be cheaper next month? Why would you invest in a, in a contracting economy? Not good. Now the Taliban are actually really bullish. If you listen to them, they're really proud of what they've done. They're really um, proud that they're standing on their own feet. They they don't have foreigners telling them what to do. They're very interested in creating new um, links with the region, trade links, economic links. They boast about things, but actually the reality is pretty, pretty worrying. And I would say stagnation is probably the best on offer for Afghanistan, if not for the contraction of the economy. So that's... I'd say that's the main problem that the Emirate faced. Now, how has it ruled since taking over? Well, if we look at public finance and that follows on from the economy, the Taliban were a taxing insurgency. So in the areas under their control, they taxed people heavily. They didn't spend the money on, on services. That was paid for still by the government, by taxpayers in the Republic or taxpayers here um, through aid and in other um, donor countries, uh, they spent the money on, on, on the war effort. So they moved in, when they moved in, they kept on taxing. We were talking to people as the districts fell and the first thing often that the Taliban did when they took, a, took over a district was start taxing people. Uh, they've been very, very efficient. Also with customs, again, first thing they did was take the customs posts and domestic revenues are actually up from the Republic, even though the economy is smaller. 
Um, and that's because there was a three-way split in the past. If you think about you, you pay your taxes or you pay bribes not to pay your taxes or your customs, some of that money went into the pockets of officials, some went into the pockets of Taliban commanders, some went to the treasury. There's now a only there's not a three-way split anymore. It goes to the treasury. Um, there's less bribery when it comes to the revenues. The Taliban have introduced the new taxes of Usher and Zakat, uh, which are Islamic taxes. Usher, 10% of uh, the harvest in Afghanistan. Zakat, on typically on livestock increase. These were not taken by the Republic. Uh, Zakat is a personal obligation for all Muslims. It's one of the five pillars of Islam. Most Muslim states don't take Usher and Zakat. They see it as a private obligation. The Taliban do. There's been a huge transfer of resources from rural households to the state. Uh, the minister and the Ministry of Agriculture takes it, not the Ministry of Finance. The um, the minister, acting minister, uh, Maulawi Atullah Omari, he boasted last summer that they took one billion dollars last year. And if you think that the UN is putting one point eight billion in in humanitarian aid, remittances are about two billion. It's it's huge completely unknown what happens to that money. It goes to the Supreme Leader's office. Uh, they say this, give it to widows and poor people, but we don't know what happens to that. And that is pretty well par for the course for spending. So the Taliban have been really transparent on getting revenue, but in terms of spending, don't know. They, they published one three month mini budget, unlike the, the Republic, which published pages of budget, very transparent. Taliban have published three months. So that was the last three months of the year 1400, 2000, and back end of 21 into 22. Um, the World Bank have got a few more figures. Subsequently, we did quite a lot of work on that, that spending, and it's, it's not good. It's mainly operational, fair enough. They don't have the on-budget aid to do development. 95% operational, mostly on salaries but look what they're spending the money on. And this is money from Afghan taxpayers now, really hard up in a contracting economy. 60% goes on security. So the three, three big ministries in order are interior, education and higher education and defense, all taking about a fifth of the budget and the GDI, the Taliban intelligence taking a further 8%. This is a country at peace is spending 60% of its of government revenue on security and indeed expanding. So the army was, uh, this is the MOD's only figures, the Ministry of Defense, um, the Ministry of Defense, 150,000 personnel in 22, 117, 23, they're planning for 180 this year. And in the World Bank's words, they say that the interim Taliban administration, which is what they call the Kabul government, is utilizing available resources largely to pay for security, teacher salaries, and core civil and administrative functions, while leaving donors to finance healthcare, food security, broader education needs, and the agri-food system. So these are the Taliban's choices. And if you're, you know, for them, they think about how to consolidate their regime. Of course, they want to pay their own people. But for, as I said, for a country, at peace with all so many problems, I think 60% of the budget is scandalous. So coming on to the, the, the second point of how the Taliban are ruling uh, social restrictions, and I could have spent the whole time talking about these. Um, you know, read the, the reports by from UNAMA Human Rights, from Richard Bennett, the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Afghanistan, from Amnesty, from Human Rights Watch, from Drops, from um, Rawadari. In the, there's a lot written and documented about what's been going wrong. So in terms of how, are you able to voice your dissatisfaction with the Emirate? Well, yes, but you might end up in prison. Um, it's tricky. Uh, demonstrations, they were there, they were happening early on. 
really only now some very brave feminists uh, are risking that and they may get um, detained for long periods of time. Um, you could get beaten up. It's 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 a brave person who does that. Um, journalists as well have been detained and beaten and tortured. Um, so that whole, you know, the, again, the Republic for all its many faults, there was much better freedom of expression. Um, it was a it was a less it, it was a safer country in, in which to voice dissident views. Um, and also at, at the very, very sharp end, we've got people being killed. So former members of the ANSF, the Afghan security forces, judges, prosecutors, it, it happens, um, you know, it, and, it, and they're documented. And then, of course, I guess the, you know, the the real victims of social restrictions are women and girls. And again, you know, I can list them uh, what schooling primary age only. Now that's in, that's an improvement from the first Emirate when even primary school age girls were were stopped from going to school. Um, but it's pretty poor in a country where the women have enjoyed where there were schools and where there was security. And you know, you were in a in a family where your father was happy for you to go to school or your mum. There were those there were those possibilities to get an education that's gone now. Uh, similarly, with uh, university education gone, um, with work again slightly better than the first Emirate when there was a total ban apart from on healthcare. This time it's a ban on working for NGOs, UN, embassy, uh, except in the health and education spheres. Uh, there's still women on telly, brave women and brave uh, proprietors. I'd, I'd say still, they're wearing niqab, but they're there. Um, women were sent home largely from government offices uh, with they're being paid, but they're, they're at home. Women are being allowed to work in the private sector, difficult, but possible. Oh, it's, it's not illegal, it's not banned. I want to cross my fingers and touch wood when I say these things. Um, I, I'd say that the difference with the 1990s, the restrictions were stricter, but there was no social media or camera phones, no phones. So there was a more room for, for, you know, the authorities to turn a blind eye if they wanted to. There were schools in, I went to schools in, in Kabul that were there and running in 2000. They were illegal, but they were, they were allowed to happen. It's more difficult now. Um, aid agencies are managing to get women working in some places um, with some local agreements. But as we know, these things can be switched off at the, you know, like this, if if the Amir changes his mind or enforces. Uh, travel, I've talked about, um, for women, it's really difficult. We, you know, every day we, we hear of, um, you know, women not being allowed into taxis or on buses, um, clothes. We've had a spate of the vice and virtue police uh, arresting women for wearing the wrong clothes. Um, so there's been a sort of movement, you know, the Taliban, when they introduced the Emir, introduced his dress code, he said, it's, it's best for women to stay at home. That's the best uh, hijab for women. But if you do have to go out, wear a burqa or a, a buy a black sort of Arab style coat, um, not Arab actually, Gulf states, I think the many in the, amongst Palestinians and Syrians would object to be saying it was Arab and a niqab. So, uh, so eyes out and and men are in charge of policing that so your your dad or your brother or your son and I wanted to just say a little nudge about how we think about Afghan women because there was a do you remember in before um 2021 there's a lot of talk about how the the you know the Afghan women activists were an elite they were an urban elite who didn't represent women and women in the rural areas were quite happy with conservative values um, and uh, AAN, my organization, we decided to talk to rural women. Um, and it was one of those lovely pieces of research where you're you're confounded by the answers. So you go in with expectations and what people tell you is, is actually very different. And regardless of where they lived, how conservative their particular bit of Afghan society was, all these women were hoping for, that it was, it was couched as 
what do you hope for with peace? That was the that was the framework. Everyone hoped for more agency, more more freedom to travel, to go to school, to help their society, to help their families, um, for their girls to go to school, for themselves to be able to go back to school if they'd missed out on education. And actually, that you know what they longed for was not actually that much different from what the the the, the women with voices in the urban areas were talking about. So the, you know, this is something that's that's very painful, I think, for everyone who is either Afghan who or who works on Afghanistan. This this restricting of women's lives and girls' hopes and ambitions. Um, thirdly, talking about how the the emirate is ruling, is looking at the nature of who has power now. Afghanistan is a multi-ethnic country, as you all know. It has Sunnis. It has Shia Muslims. Who is in power? They are men. They are mainly mullahs. Mainly mullahs, overwhelmingly mullahs, overwhelmingly Pashtun, mainly from the south and the southeast. Few Uzbeks, a few Tajiks. This is not a representative government. Um, and it, it's very different, for, again, for all the problems with the Republic. You could, for Afghans, you could see people like yourself in the parliament, in the ministries. If you were from, I don't know, Dai Kundi, you could come to Kabul and stay in the MP's guest house and try and lobby for what you needed to do. For a network society, this is a disaster for most people. You need people who look like you, who you know, who you have ethnic or clan or tribal relations with to get things done, to get a job, to get a contract, to get the road in your village fixed, whatever it is. If you don't have those contacts, it's really, really difficult. And um, I mean, particularly if you're if you're if you're Shia, if you're Hazara, um, you've got a you've got a government now that wants to impose um, Sunni Hanafi rule. Also, actually, if you're Salafist, so Salafists have also been targeted for killing uh, Taliban. Say they're either ISKP or they're they're promoting ISKP. This is Islamic State in uh, Khorasan province. Um, and we also see, for example, that you know the um, detention of women for wearing bad clothing, bad hijab. That was a lot was in West Kabul. And it looked like targeting of Hazaras, for example. It's really, really difficult. Uh, we've been following the Kuchi Hazara land disputes, old, 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 old problems. And there tends to be a finding in favor of the of the Kuchis who were Pashtun. And you know, with every turn of the of the wheel, there will be new winners and new losers. And it's clear who the losers are at the moment. But it's also clear that it's a really, really exclusive government. Most people don't have uh, most people don't have a say. So that brings me to uh, my, the end of my talk, which is sorry. I just wanted to say one other thing about the, the 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 way that the Taliban are ruling is that they've been gradually tightening restrictions, gradually consolidating their rule. We saw purges early on of the army, the police the intelligence, uh, they used the biometric data that the uh, US had thankfully left behind, thankfully, uh, helpfully left behind. And even for example, you know, you might have been a, a laborer who happened to work on an on a army base, your biometrics are there, you'll get sacked. We've spoken to people like that. So it didn't even have to do anything. There are a few people who were, who were still in the security services, they're technically able, um, as with the first Emra, um, at that point, I knew a ex-PDPA fighter pilot, a tank commander, both Pashtun. They were technically useful for the Emra. They were kept on. So we've seen that as well in small, small examples. Judges purged. Again, a few, a few male judges have been kept on. Uh, all the women, pretty well from the from the legal system, have been purged. They haven't kept they haven't kept their posts, so they're not being paid. Uh, we see what looked like to be political commissars sent to the universities. They outrank the the vice chancellors where the vice chancellors are still in place. We see the curricula changing, uh, something that we're going to be looking at 
in the next few months, I hope, is looking at the madrasa curriculum and what's happening to that. Um, again, I remember in the in the first Emirate, one of my friends was studying medicine and he said, we do more Quran than anatomy. <laughs> so, you know, uh -huh. a country like Afghanistan needs mullahs, but does it need mullahs in every every office? And many of the civil servants, they're still with their jobs, but they're thinking, am I am I training my successors? That's a real fear. So coming back to 2001 and why the Taliban lost power. Actually, not why they lost power, but why the peace didn't last. So in 2001, we saw that the various factions grabbed power. They were squabbling amongst themselves, but they wanted to... You know, um, General Fahim, defense minister, of the 100 generals that he appointed, 90 were from his own faction. This is Antonio Gistotz's figures. Uh, the chief of staff, I think it was 37 out of 40, were from his from his faction, or at least Tajik. You know, and we saw this everywhere, everywhere there was a grabbing of power. Um, worse than that, though, I think was the persecution that went on. So we saw civilian populations of Pashtuns in the north being targeted for, they were killed, raped, looted by the winning factions of the Northern Alliance, Hizbi Wahadat, Jumbesh, Jermiat, Shirai Nazar. We saw in Kabul, um, Hizbi Islami tried to have a political meeting in Kabul in 2002. Um, the Shirai Nazar controlled police force arrested their old political rivals, 100 people arrested. Uh, we saw, you know, Karzai refused a, a, an amnesty. He refused to allow a Taliban political party. And at the time, it was very strange because the Taliban seemed to accept that they'd lost power. They went home. Many of them, the senior leaders went across to Pakistan, but they were reaching out to the new people in government trying to get security guarantees. People who were upset with the government, they were trying to be included. They didn't want to overthrow it. There was a lot of talk about, we want to be part of the government this time. We want to be part of the power in Kabul. And yet we saw the Americans pursue this fantasy of a Taliban remnant, hunting down the Taliban remnants. And they, they there was a mass campaign of arbitrary detention with torture, stripping men in public, sending dogs into people's homes. I've looked at the people who went to Car to, Af to Guantanamo from Afghanistan, I and mean, there were Taliban there, but there were also abused boys. There were anti-Taliban tribal leaders, shepherds, taxi drivers, men with dementia, you name it. It was just scooping up. They were the tip of the iceberg. Most Afghans never got beyond the forward operating bases in Bagram. I met interpreters who'd seen Afghans killed. Um, uh, one man had been, he'd died of, of dehydration in Kuna. Of course, we had Gul Rahman, a uh, driver of Hekmatia's uh, son-in-law, Khairat Bahir, who rose to death in the salt, CIA salt pit north of Kabul. Horrible atrocities, persecution, not letting the Taliban live in peace. And a lot of the, the, the new... The new people in power used the American CIA and special forces to persecute their old enemies in the name of Taliban or Al Qaeda, tribal or, or factional enemies. And what was really interesting was that um, despite all this, and despite the horrible corruption of the new government, Afghans were so long suffering, they were so patient with, with the change. You know, I spoke to people in, um, for example, in Saidabad in, in Wardak province, who said, you know, we'd get occasionally get these Taliban emissaries coming through and they say, come on, jihad, you know, this government in Kabul is terrible. And we'd say, get lost. We don't want jihad this time. We want the peace to work. And in the end, it didn't work, but it was only because the Taliban were able to piggyback on this unhappiness. And of course, you know, many things happened between then and 2021. You know, the Taliban as an insurgency committed many, many atrocities. And in the end, it was an Afghan versus Afghan fight. There was very little foreign foreigners fighting after 2014 when ISAF withdrew. Calling it a jihad at that point, I think, was even in Islamic, you know, in Islamic terms, it was deeply problematic. But that 
nugget, the way that the insurgency started, I think has has lessons for the for the Taliban now. You rule at your peril. You rule a multi-ethnic country at your peril if you try and grab all the power. If you beat women up for wearing the wrong clothes. If you don't allow parents to send their girls to school when they've when that's been their experience for twenty years. You tax people to the hilt. You spend all their money on the security forces. I I I think that if you look back at 2001 and why the insurgency started, why the Republic fell eventually, I think that's also a warning to the current leaders in Kabul. How you rule in victory may determine how long you will rule. Thanks very much. <laughs>